We will uh, explore the use of fully controlled multiple reactor systems that offer simple yet powerful data analysis uh, tools like temperature and pressure monitoring. These technologies provide chemists with uh, data-rich experiments for state-of-the-art process development for pharma and fine specialty chemicals. These in-situ and real-time techniques like uh, heat flow training, calorimetry and gas uptake measurement can be used individually or simultaneously as you will discover in the following case studies. Obviously there are other useful in-situ techniques that I'm not going to talk about today that can also be applied. A few of them are for instance uh, gas flow, pH, torque, mid-infrared, FBRM, or turbidity. These can be discussed offline if you wish. We'll begin this webinar with a brief introduction to accurate temperature control and measurement, heat flow, calorimetry, and to the tools that we used in the application examples that follow. After that, we'll examine the following four case studies with uh, some progression along the way regarding the techniques involved. The first example will be about hydrogenation of cyclohexene, focusing on the use of heat flow training to quickly extract simple and relevant information. The second example, formation of an imine, will be about the combined use of heat flow training and calorimetry. Then, we talk about a Grignard reaction with some emphasis on process development and process safety. And finally, we'll discuss a nitrobenzene hydrogenation example combining heat flow training and gas uptake measurement. We'll finally wrap up this webinar with a question and answer session. Let's start with a quick overview of the way many of us still run chemistry in the lab, using a round bottom flask and an oil bath. The temperature of the bath, weather, oil or ice is mostly kept constant. If an exothermic event occurs due to a chemical reaction, for instance, the temperature of the reaction mixture will raise. There is, however, a major limitation with such a setup. It is rarely temperature sensitive enough to be able to extract any relevant information. As you can see on this chart, taken as an example, you may see some variation of the reaction temperature, but this variation will most often be too small or too erratic to really tell you anything. A second aspect of this lack of accuracy of temperature measurement is illustrated on the following chart. I'm sure many of you can relate it to the real life case when an exotherm is not caught up at a small scale early on and gives you a bad surprise or a headache when you move to a larger scale and see a 40 degrees temperature increase with all the associated safety and product quality aspects. And this simple fact is due to the large difference in heat transfer capacity between a small lab vessel and a plant vessel. A good rule of thumb is that 30 watts per liter is usually considered as the upper limit for heat removal in plant vessels. That much heat generally gives no more than 2 degrees difference between the bath and the reaction vessel at the lab scale. This can really be easily overlooked. Now, let's see how a process can be better run. Most of the time, the reaction rate is temperature dependent. For this reason, a better way to run a reaction at the lab scale is to do it under isothermal conditions. It means keeping TR, reaction temperature, constant along the course of the reaction. When an exothermic reaction occurs, TJ, or jacket temperature, will be automatically decreased to keep TR constant. In other words, Instead of keeping TJ constant and monitoring TR variations, TR is kept constant and TJ varies. Now you can pretty much see the green signal here corresponding to a TR minus TJ as a real time in C2 probe or sensor that allows to obtain a terrific amount of information like reaction onset and reaction end, crystallization events, delayed initiation and reaction dynamics, as we are going to see through a few examples later on during this webinar. If we go a step further and take the simple and common case of reaction run under constant temperature, also called 
isothermal conditions, the energy released by the reaction is an expression of Ua, or calibration factor of the system, and Tr minus Tj, or heat flow. Tr minus Tj can be seen as the driving force for energy exchange between the reaction mixture and its environment. Ua, the calibration factor, is measured during a calibration step. This formula here allows to convert Tr minus Tj constantly and accurately measured along the course of the reaction into heat flow Q against time. Reaction calorimetry actually measures the instantaneous heat flow from the reaction. The reaction rate is related to the reaction heat flow, which makes rate the primary measured parameter of calorimetry. This is different from conventional methods like chromatography or spectroscopy, which give concentration as a measured parameter. Rate, in this case, is the derivative of concentration as a function of time. In a way, this makes calorimetry an ideal complementary analytical method. Now, if you look at a real heat flow profile, like this one, you see time on the x-axis and reaction heat flow, or QR, on the y-axis. So QR is actually expressed in watt, which is joule per second. The way you obtain the reaction enthalpy is by looking at the integral of QR over the entire course of the reaction, and this gives delta HR, or reaction enthalpy. The software actually does an iterative integration of the heat flow signal against time, which allows to obtain the thermal conversion profile. This is extremely useful with the Multimax because you can get a preliminary idea of process safety with thermal accumulation data, for instance, in up to four reactors at the same time. Again, we'd go over a real-life example to illustrate this point. Now, let's summarize what we just said. If you have a system that measure and control TR and TJ accurately and reliably, then calorimetry can be used as an in-situ real-time technique. As a result, when it's been confirmed, or in other words, calibrated using another method, it can be used as the main analytical method that does not require sample and can work on a 10 24 7 For instance, on this chart that I borrowed from one of Donna Blackman's publications, nitrobenzene hydrogenation was monitored using gas uptake, heat flow, and mid infrared spectroscopy. The three methods showed consistent results, meaning that the desired reaction was indeed being followed. Sometimes, calorimetry is not just a more convenient in C2 technique to use, but also the only good one, when, for instance, conventional techniques like chromatography become uneasy, when the compounds to be analyzed are, un are unstable or require deritization, or when they are highly toxic and confinement is necessary or when there is just no available analytical method. I suggest to take a quick look at the kind of instruments that we used in the following application examples. These instruments allow to take full advantage of temperature control experiments. Three reactor blocks can fit on the same docking station. From the smaller to the larger scale we have uh, 16 tubes of the 20 mil mostly for early process research work, or for mechanically stirred reactors of 50 milliliters for screening and early process development, or two reactors of 250 mil for more advanced uh, development like small, uh, small sample preparation or process characterization. Just uh, to take a closer look at the 4 by 50 mil vessel system, it offers very accurate temperature and strain control with uh, several impeller options. It has automated data logging and parameter control. Calorimetry is also available. The same Ultimax technology and equipment allows to accommodate pressure vessels. They're made out of uh, Hasseloy HC22 and can stand pressure up to 200 bar. These vessels feature a magnetic stir drive and are outfitted with a gassing stir. Pressure control can be either fully manual or fully automatic in each individual vessel if using a pressure controller. To finish, let's take a look at the various dosing options. 
The most familiar way to chemistry is probably the dropping funnel that you can see in the middle. Um, and that can also be used with the Multimax. Uh, this particular dropping funnel has actually been modified with an electronic valve which allows to start and stop adding automatically using the computer. The experiment being completely unattended. The flow can also be automatically uh, changed. The second dosing option is a dispense box which differs from a regular syringe pump by having a four-way electronic valve so that the same syringe can actually be used to feed four vessels at the same time and at a different speed. This dispenser box is also computer controlled and can be used and attended once it's been cleaned and primed. The third option is to use a pump and a balance. This is gravimetric dosing by contrast with volumetric dosing like with the dispenser box. Gravimetric dosing is sometimes a better imitation of how a process is run in the plant with the use of uh, heavy duty scales, drums and pumps. Now let's move to the case studies. We are going to start with the hydrogenation of cyclohexene to highlight the power of heat flow training for early feasibility assessment. A Multimax 4x50 system was used for this study, equipped with 50 mL Hastelloy pressure vessels. On the chemistry side, cyclohexene is converted into cyclohexane under hydrogenation conditions using a catalyst, hydrogen gas and methanol as a solvent. Reactor 1 is charged with a reference catalyst or benchmark. The same amount of another catalyst is charged to reactor 2. Reactor 3 and 4 are charged with an increasing amount of the same catalyst as in reactor 2. I'd like to show you now how much information you can get from a quick and easy evaluation through graphical display of heat flow versus time. The x-axis represents time, whereas the y-axis represents the minus Tj. Any exothermic reaction we give, we give a TR minus TJ signal raising above the baseline. In this uh, particular example, we can see that it took approximately an hour and 20 minutes for the reaction with the benchmark catalyst to go to completion, whereas uh, an equivalent amount of the other catalyst get, that gets the reaction to completion in less than an hour. Incre increasing the amount of this catalyst gives a faster reaction, uh, which is reactor 3, up to a certain point, reactor 4, where the bottleneck is probably elsewhere, maybe mass transfer. So a, a likely further step here would probably be to test the reaction at various stirring speed. You get here the kind of data that would be difficult to obtain using alternative chromatographic methods, where you would have, you would have to pull out a sample every so often and, and run an analysis which uh, in the best case takes about uh, 20 to 30 minutes if you include sample time and sample. As a conclusion for this uh, first case study I would state the obvious that the reaction endpoint is the minimum necessary when conducting a reaction screening. The message here is that the heat flow training can be used easily and graphically to determine the, the endpoints of a particular reaction and this in up to four vessels at the same time. So what we've learned here is that the new catalyst is more active than the benchmark and that the reaction can be made faster by increasing the amount up to a certain point where catalyst load is not critical to the reaction rate anymore. In this case uh, mass transfer is the likely bottleneck. Conducting a mixing study is indeed probably a natural follow-up to this investigation. The next case study I like to look at is the formation of an imine. The study was conducted using a 4x50 milliliter vessel system with uh, glass vessels and specific equipment required for calorimetry. Here's the chemistry. Uh, benzaldehyde was added to isobutylamine in the presence of an acid catalyst and methanol used as a solvent. The reaction temperature was either 20 degrees or 40 degrees. The reaction mixture was liquid, completely homogeneous. The chemistry was preliminary validated in a batch mode using mid infrared and heat flow training. A second study was then decided to take a look at the reaction 
under semi-batch conditions using heat flow training and calorimetry and also to determine whether mixing or temperature was the cause for rate limitation. Like I said, uh, the reaction was initially validated using React IR. Under batch conditions, the reaction is fast, completed in a few minutes. From these initial results, it was difficult to tell though whether the reaction rate was limited due to mixing or due to temperature as both temperature and mixing appear to impact reaction time. Then the idea was to slow down the chemistry a little bit by adding benzaldehyde over five minutes instead of in one shot and to look at the conversion after five minutes which is the end of dosing. Uh, by conversion here um, I mean thermal conversion derived by calculation from the reaction heat flow. As I explained earlier during this presentation, uh, so here again is time on the x-axis and on the y-axis are reaction heat flow, dosing and uh, thermal conversion. So the way thermal conversion can be obtained at the end of dosing is by simply pointing the cursor to the end of dosing and reading the conversion value for the red curve on the y-axis. It is about 72% uh, in this case. When doing so for all four reactions, it was observed that uh, thermal conversion at the end of dosing was similar for both reactions at 20 degrees, approximately 70%, whatever the stirring speed was, uh, 1000 or 200 RPM. A similar result was obtained at 40 degrees. Uh, thermal conversion was 85% with a stirring speed at 200 RPM or 1000 RPM. These results really excluded mixing as the cause for rate limitation and pointed to temperature. The heat of reaction, almost 4 kJ, was also obtained dr during this experiment. In conclusion for these second case studies, I would insist on the fact that uh, calorimetry allows to obtain thermal conversion, like I showed at the beginning of this presentation. Thermal conversion can be used as an almost continuous and real-time analytical technique. So um, it allows, for instance, to study the impact of mixing or the impact of reaction temperature and reaction rate and kinetic profile. You can obviously extend this list to a variety of parameters that are relevant for process development studies like addition rates or concentration. For more advanced process development, uh, reagent accumulation during a reaction really becomes a critical parameter as well as reaction dynamics and kinetic profile. These are all used for process troubleshooting when conducting uh, scale-up studies. So precisely the next case studies is uh, very much about scale-up using a Grignard reaction as, a, as an example. This investigation was performed at the Swiss Institute for the Promotion of Safety and Security using a 2 by 250 milliliter reactor multimax system and uh, calorimetry equipment. The chemistry involves the formation of four methyl magnesium bromide with uh, actually from four bromotoluene and magnesium metal using a combination of THF and toluene as solvents. The, the Grignard reaction is known to be highly, highly exothermic with a delayed initiation due to a tricky catalyst activation. Uh, the study objectives were typical for a relatively advanced development step. Heat of reaction, delayed initiation, iodine effects, actually iodine is a catalyst activator, impact of mixing and reagent accumulation, mostly for safety purposes. Heat for training and calorimetry were used as analytical tools. The reaction was conducted using a standard procedure, not under reflux though. The mixture of solvents was charged to the reactor, magnesium metal was added, the slurry was heated to 40 degrees, and a thermal calibration was conducted. After this, 4 bromotoluene was added portion wise, and once the reaction was finished, another calibration was run. Two 50 milliliter vessels were run in parallel for a consistency check. Here again is uh, on the, the x-axis uh, time 
and on the y-axis is mass for for bromotoluene dosing and also heat flow. Most of the time, a Grignard reaction in the lab is conducted by charging the reagents and slowly adding 4-bromotoluene portion-wise, slowly, until the reaction kicks in. At some point, the addition of iodine may be necessary to initiate the reaction. As you can see, when the reaction kicks in, it really does, yielding a huge exotherm. The good point, though, is that the reaction is quick and apparently does not give much accumulation. Visually speaking, at least, uh, the reaction looks almost complete at the end of dosing. In this case, heat flow training is, is a great tool because you can see in real time whether the reaction has started or not. Uh, bottom line, we are learning here that there is a late initiation of about 60 to 80 minutes, range given by two, the two parallel experiments run in the similar conditions. Uh, then the reaction is completed uh, an hour and 15 minutes after the beginning of 4-bromotoluene addition. There is also probably much to say about the reaction dynamic here, but I'd like to save this for a later discussion. In addition to giving all this information, uh, let's now look at the sensitivity. If you look closer here, you will notice a small bump in the heat flow profile curve that actually can be attributed to the addition of a small amount of iodine. This small amount of iodine did initiate the reaction to a certain extent, but not to the point where the reaction really kicked in. The point here is that the system sensitivity is such that even a small exothermic event, like here, the expected impact of iodine, can easily be detected, which makes it difficult to miss any valuable information that would allow to uh, better understand the chemistry. Another aspect of heat profiling is uh, because it's real time, you can do a quick and dirty assessment of how much impact stirring has, for instance. In this example, when stirring is stopped, look at the blue curve, the reaction stops, as the red curve, which is the heat of reaction, shows. It takes only about two minutes for heat flow to go down. When going into the quantitative aspect of calorimetry, the heat of reaction is probably the first parameter you want to obtain. It was estimated uh, to be about uh, 19 kJ per mole in this case. If process safety is important to you, there are two parameters to pay attention to very carefully. Uh, one that you can sh see here is the maximum heat output, which has very much to do with the, the heat of reaction, but also how fast the reaction is and how fast the reagent addition was achieved. In this case, the maximum heat output is 22 watt, which is just gigantic at the 50 milliliter scale. Usually for safe scale-up, you're looking at values around 20 to 40 watts per liter. So we are talking here about a 20-fold excess energy. The second important parameter is, is thermal accumulation at the end dosing. At the beginning of this presentation, I explained the relation that links thermal accumulation and thermal conversion. If there is a, a coolant failure at the plant scale, a very bad uh, time for this to occur is at the end of dosing, when all the reagent has been added and there is nothing you can really do. So uh, to prevent a potentially catastrophic runaway event, you want to make sure that reagent accumulation remains below a certain value, like uh, probably 10% or 20%. Uh, let's uh, now try to summarize and see what uh, we learn here. Well, to start in a simple way, heat flow training told us that there is a delayed initiation of about 60 to 80 minutes and that the reaction is completed about an hour and 50 minutes after the addition was started. The addition itself took an hour and 35 minutes to achieve, meaning that it doesn't take that long after the end of the addition for the reaction to be complete. Another point is that the reaction starts after about 30% uh, bromotoluene has been added, uh, which makes the reaction difficult and hazardous to scale up under these conditions. Besides, we saw the impact of a small amount of iodine with a small heat flow bump. This doesn't really come as a surprise, uh, as we do know that iodine is a catalyst promoter for the green air reaction. We were also able to check that the reaction stops when stirring is stopped.
which is important to know uh, both from safety and scale-up standpoint. Now, a calorimetry tells us that heat flow was estimated to be close to 18 to 19 kilojoule per mole bromotoluene. The maximum heat output is huge and makes the reaction unscalable under these uh, very conditions. 500 watts per liter was uh, generated at the maximum. Uh, a good rule of thumb is to avoid going uh, usually above 30 watts per liter for a safe scale-up. However, because the reaction is fast, accumulation was little, about 10% at the end of dosing. Uh, a probably a natural follow-up to this initial investigation would be, for instance, to automatically adjust dosing as a function of the reaction temperature and check how long it takes to dose all four uh, bromotoluene while keeping reaction temperature below 42 or maybe 43 degrees and this can be done uh, completely automatically. Now it's time to move on to the last uh, case study of this webinar which is about the hydrogenation of nitrobenzene using combined heat flow training and gas uptake. Here's the chemistry. Nitrobenzene reacts under 2 to 6 bar hydrogen pressure in the presence of 1 mole percent palladium and charcoal. The solvent is methanol and the reaction temperature of 50 degrees. The following equipment was used for the study. A 50 millimeter multimax pressure vessel equipped with a digital pressure gauge. The vessel is uh, fed from a hydrogen reservoir through a manual regulating valve and the reservoir is also equipped with a pressure gauge. The reservoir is filled with hydrogen only once at the beginning, then the vessel is purged and pressurized. The stir is turned on and the reaction starts. As the reaction progresses and hydrogen is consumed, the pressure drops in the reservoir. This pressure drop is converted by the Multimax software into gas uptake or gas consumption expressed in moles or in volume. As you can see on this uh, chart where gas consumption is plotted against time, the gas uptake rate is a function of pressure and as uh, one can expect, the higher the pressure, the faster the reaction. The amount of hydrogen consumed by the reaction mixture is not pressure dependent though, just the rate is. Now another way of monitoring the reaction is using heat flow. As with gas uptake measurement, it appears that, as expected, the higher the pressure, the faster the reaction. Heat flow as well as gas uptake can easily give us the reaction end point. Gas consumption, being a cumulative parameter, gives directly access to the amount of gas consumed by the reaction mixture. The slide uh, shows a view that is directly obtained in the Multimax software when running an experiment. Both heat flow and gas uptake can be plotted at the same time. This allows to make a correlation between the two and look for consistency. As you can see here, both signals indicate an exothermic event starting at the same time and ending at the same time. Another way of taking advantage of the gas uptake signal is by varying the strength speed and looking at how the gas uptake signal behaves. In other words, again, it's about using gas uptake as an in situ and real time analytical technique. In this case, a strength speed increase from 1000 to 1500 rpm results in a faster gas uptake, which means that mass transfer was clearly rate limiting at 1000 rpm. In summary, gas uptake and heat flow can be used as a complementary method. Uh, both methods are consistent and indicate a reaction endpoint after 45 minutes under 2.4 bar, 35 minutes under 4 bar, and 25 minutes under 6.3 bar. We've also seen that gas uptake could be used to quickly and, and directly assess mass transfer limitations at 1000 rpm by increasing stirring speed and looking at the impact on the gas uptake profile. I think it's uh, time to wrap up what we've seen today and draw some conclusions. First of all, uh, we now know that heat flow training can be used as a simple and robust PAT tool, for instance, to determine how long it takes for a reaction to reach completion. 
uh, without having to take any sample or even attending the experiment, it can tell the chemist if there is any delayed initiation uh, for how long. In addition, the shape of the heat flow signal can give valuable hints about the reaction dynamics, how vital good mixing is, for instance, and what the impact of various factors like concentration or addition rate are. In some cases, heat flow can also be used to detect the temperature onsets of a chemical reaction or a crystallization. Second, when doing a thermal calibration, heat flow can be used for calorimetric measurements. This allows for a better understanding of the process safety profile with uh, data like heat of reaction, the maximum heat output, and thermal accumulation. Better insight into reaction kinetic properties and reaction mechanism is also sometimes possible. Additionally, we've seen that gas uptake can be used as a complementary simple in situ analytical method for reactions involving a gas as a reagent. In this case, the gas uptake signal can be used to evaluate the reaction rate and reaction stoichiometry. A very important point is that heat flow, calorimetry and gas uptake can sometimes be used as hassle-free alternatives to conventional methods. As no sampling is required, the experiment can be studied and left unattended, yet being accurately monitored automatically. Uh, finally, uh, as this reaction knowledge can be acquired in parallel, fast and better design synthetic routes became a reality for me when I was a process development chemist, and I hope it will be the same for you.